Uh, welcome everyone to the 45th Fireside Chat. Uh, we'd like to thank Oliver again and Justin for all the work they do on the server and providing this Fireside Chat. And we'll start today with Will. He has um, a couple of questions for you, Tom. So please go ahead, Will. And everyone else, please be on uh, mute. Hi, Tom. How are you doing? Just fine, Will. Good to see you. So, uh, again. so I have a, a question for you about uh, synchronicity. Uh, so um, at some point in the recent past, I noticed that an amount, uh, that the amount of synchronicity in my life has increased dramatically. Now I'm trying to kind of understand exactly um, how synchronicity works as far as the LCS goes. For example, let's say I'm having a problem with my car only to discover that it was really lucky that I found the problem when I did. And coincidentally, I ordered some plastic thing a couple weeks earlier that works perfectly for my present situation. Now, you know, when I try to wrap my mind around that, I, if, I, if I think about it as I had an intent for a best possible scenario, that was uh, not that I did not have that intent when I ordered that plastic gizmo that happened to show up at my door just at the right time so that I could use it in this particular situation. So I'm trying to understand how exactly that might work. Do you think you can uh, kind of clarify or send a couple of tidbits my way? Sure. Uh, well, there's a couple of things at play, Will, and uh, it could be more or less of any of them. But uh, one, you're probably more aware of things like that happening than you were before. So you are more likely to to notice it and spot it um, than earlier. So that's probably a 10% of it or a 20% of it, not a big part, but uh, you are more open to the existence of synchronicity. Therefore, when you see it, you notice it as opposed to you just let it slide on by. What synchronicity is, is the, the larger consciousness system helping you succeed and helping you also have have uh, firsthand experience in the fact that synchronicities exist. In other words, that's part of your growing. You see these synchronicities and you know, well, that's really odd that this could have happened. And if it happened once, you wouldn't pay any attention to it. But when it happens again and again and again, and the probability that all those things would have just come together on their own by accident, well, okay, a few of them maybe, but, you know, three or four a day or, you know, three or four a week uh, constantly, then you begin to see, no, there's something else going on here. It's uh, it's not uh, just randomness happening. There's, there's some motion going on. Well, the system can do that just to give you that experience, that firsthand experience that there is something more to this reality than just, um, you know, the material reality that there are forces, there are things happening that uh, are at a deeper, uh, more significant level than just the physical stuff. So that's one reason why you might get it. The way the system does that is within the, within the things that happen and the things that you think and do, there is, there are uh, spaces for either nudging, nudging you to do something like go ahead and order that plastic part. Because the system can look at the future probability and see the probability that you're going to use that. Uh, also, when the system is making a measurement, when you require something of the system, often there are multiple possibilities, multiple things that could happen uh, and various probabilities that they might happen. Typically, that's a random draw. But if the system is particularly interested in helping you grow up, instead of a random draw, it might just pick one of those possibilities that, uh, you know, interacts with you in a positive way. So it helps you see that bigger picture. So the system can set you up to succeed in both of those ways by, by nudging you and by modifying your reality within the uncertainty of that reality. See, the fact that you have multiple possibilities in any measurements you make, anything that you do, there's multiple possibilities, 
then it can kind of <clears throat> manage that that random draw from that probability distribution to come out the way it would like to. So the, the message is the system is working with you. All right. You're working with the system, Will. You are trying to grow up. You're trying to, to learn. You're trying to find firsthand information for verification. You're working on it. And anybody that is working with the system, the system will work with you. So that's why you're seeing a lot more of them now than you did, say, five years ago. Not just that you're paying attention more now, but it's really happening a lot more now because you're working with the system now and you weren't five years ago. So that's the big difference. You work with it, it works with you. The system wants everybody to grow up to the maximum extent possible. And by possible, I mean that they have the free will and the, and the wherewithal to reach on their own. You have to do it. The system can't do it for you, but it can help you. It can make it easier. It can give you some experience. So that's, I think, why you have them. That's how they work. And uh, it's probably just going to be a part of your life now because you have made your growth a part of your life now and the synchronicity is going to just work like that you'll find eventually that almost everything you really need or want like that plastic part just kind of falls at your feet just in time for you to you know to put it into place things happen um just right just to make things work out well for you and that's the idea of giving up trying to control things. You realize that life actually is optimal without your control. If you just be and grow and have a positive intent, things will just happen to work out. Like I say, you get just what you need just as you need it. And that becomes almost a way of life. And it has not just to do with car parts, but it has to do with everything in your life. You just meet the people you need. You just find the book that you need. You just run into, you know, the person that you need to talk to, even though you didn't know you needed to talk to them, just at the time you need it. So then you realize, you look back at that and you say, if I, if I could control things, if I could control what happened in my life, I wouldn't be able to do it nearly as well as just letting it happen, you see? And that gives you this sense of letting go of control because it will happen in your life much, much better than, uh, than you could if you were able to control it. So it's one of those neat lessons you get to uh, just let go, deal with what happens and <laughs> If you're growing up, if you're really on that path and not just acting, but <clears throat> if you really are on that path, then what you find out is, is what happens is that life gets easier. Things happen. Things fall into place for you. Okay, so, so just, just the way so reality I, I, works. I just have a one quick question with that. So, um, so if, if, assuming that, you know, of course, uh, now, uh, assuming that that is true, then the question is, and, and I don't know if you have an answer to this one, but why? Why would the system care if my car part shows up in time and I don't have to wait an extra week or I spend an extra $150 at this sketchy mechanic over here versus the mechanic that I would take it to otherwise? Like, why would that be in the system's best interest that I am optimized in those matters? Okay, well, it. That's correct. It's not interested in saving you money or, or uh, you know, making your car work better or that sort of thing. It's interesting. It's interested in helping you grow up. And one of the things that it can do to help you grow up is show you this multidimensional reality that you're in to demonstrate to you that it's real, that reality isn't just a physical place. And by doing uh, the synchronicity sorts of things is a way of letting you know by firsthand experience that this is a bigger, more complicated reality than just physical, and also letting you know that the system is working with you, that your efforts to grow up have been recognized 
and that the system sees that they are genuine and you're not just acting, you're really trying to change at the being level. You've evidently had some success and the system is there to, to work with you. So that's pretty neat. That's a very good thing. So that's what it's trying to demonstrate. It's not trying to save you money in car parts or make sure that you're not late for an appointment. It really doesn't care so much about that. But it is letting you know that uh, it's got your back in a sense that it's working with you. And um, and like I say, your life is likely to show a lot more of that. So it, it's at least mine does. My life is a is a constant stream of those sorts of things where things just happen uh and then you look back at them and you realize that it would be very odd that all these things would just happen by accident you know they're happening for a reason and the reason is that the system's working with you okay so it would be something like the system is working with you because that's how the system works that's what we are originally and that's that's the final destination maybe yeah. or well just... er, yes well no the system's working with you because if you succeed it succeeds if you okay. lower your entropy by a bit, its entropy is lowered by that bit because you are a part of the system. So okay. the whole reason this virtual reality is here is for you to succeed here, to grow up here, and you're doing it. So you get support of the system. People who are not doing it, who are not making any progress, who don't really care, uh, they don't get that much effort put into their growth because they'll just push it aside. It won't mean anything to them. They won't appreciate it. All right. That's, uh, I think you answered my question. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, I know you had a couple of more questions and your time is a little bit limited. So if you want to go ahead and ask those other two, please do. All right. Yeah. Thanks guys. I appreciate your patience on this one. Okay. So my second question is uh, often when I go uh, out of body, I find uh, that after the session, which usually happens about four o'clock in the morning, that I try to catch a little bit of sleep before starting my, my day. Now, one thing that uh, seems to happen, uh, not every single time, but, but often, is that I'll end up in the same place that I was in the OB place, but I will not be conscious. Now, I was talking to a friend of mine, uh, and he said that I should uh, try ramping up my lucid dreaming. He says that not only will it help me in situations like that, but it will also help me improve my ability to go uh, OB more effectively. But I am hesitate, hesitant to do that because I find dreaming to be a really valuable opportunity to realize where I'm succeeding on the being level and where I'm not succeeding on the being level. And if I start doing lucid dreaming, I, you know, some part of me inside just feels like I'm giving something up. So I, I was wondering if you had a, an opinion on that. Yes, I'd say just let it alone. Let it be whatever it is. If you end up just kind of being there but not being uh, not being lucid, that's okay. Maybe that's there to help you remember it. Um, hard to say. But I wouldn't worry about it. I'd say you, if you want to take control, then you can. Um, but you're right. Your, your normal dreaming is also valuable. So I just do what you feel that you want to do. You don't have to make a decision and treat all cases the same. Sometimes you want to do one thing. Sometimes you do another. That's fine. Just let it be and uh, use it or play with it as you feel like you want to. Okay. Um, so that's great. Thank you. And uh, my last uh, question is uh, that uh, I call it paranoia versus prudence. We are currently living in a world where technology is invading privacy in a way that has never been seen before in history. Now, I watch these TED Talks. And these incredibly intelligent, knowledgeable experts tell me that I should be extremely wary about people's ability to steal and malign my information, and it's around every corner. Personally, I've never known anybody that got their, you know, home internet hacked or anything like that, and I'm not particularly uh, fearful that somebody's going to take my information, but at the same time, I am, you know, cognizant that, you know, these experts are telling me, look, you've got to really be careful. You've got to, like, guard your information. So what I want to know, Tom, is it time for me to put on the tin hat with the felt lining and, like, you know, <laughs> uh, listen to the experts here? Or should I just, uh, you know, relax? And if I do, what they're saying is that by the time 
I, um, I realized that my information is gone. It's too late because the information has been stolen. So I was just wondering, you know, do you have any kind of recommendations on how to deal with uh, our, this, this type of situation? Yes, I would agree with you. I'd say just, just relax. Um, if you, you know, what they're telling you is that these things are possible. They're not telling you that every, every word you say uh, is being recorded someplace. They're just telling you that that's possible. If people want to, uh, say, turn your speaker, you know, your phone on, you have a cell phone at home, they can turn that phone on and turn it into just a, a recorder so that they can record everything that goes on within the distance that that uh, speaker, I mean, that microphone on your cell phone can pick up. They can do it with your home phone uh, that's a landline. It can be done with all sorts of gadgets. If you know a little bit about electronics, you can turn anything that has a microphone in it into a listening and eavesdropping device. Uh, those uh, um, <clears throat> Alexa uh, boxes are the same way. It's sitting there with a microphone in it that can be turned into something that's listening. You see, now these are all possibilities. And I have the same attitude you do. Just because it's possible doesn't need, doesn't necessarily mean that I should be afraid of it. And my idea is that if I were afraid of it, let's say I <coughs> I was conspiring with others to you know over you know to take over the world or uh, you know do something crazy, then I would want I would worry about my secrecy. I would worry about potential eavesdropping. But I'm not. I live a very transparent life. <coughs> there isn't anything that I say at home or any place else that I would be particularly uh, bothered if it turned up in you know news headlines. Uh, the only bother would be that it would be terribly boring mm -hmm. to other people. So I don't uh, go around talking about taking over the world because I have no interest in that. And listening in eavesdropping on my phone would probably be such a waste of bits to intelligence collectors because there would be nothing there other than my wife and I chatting about the, you know, the books we're reading and this and that. And it would just, I live a transparent, open life. I don't do things that I would be embarrassed about. You see, I don't say things that, you know, would be upsetting to somebody. So if you don't have any information that's of any value to anybody but the person you're talking to, then I don't, I wouldn't really worry about it. So what? Okay, I can see the overall threat. And that is that there's lots of devices out there that could be turned into eavesdropping devices. Everything in your house that has a mic and also is connected to the internet in some way can be turned in to a listening device. Even if it's just your telephone that's not connected to the internet, it's connected to electronics somewhere. All of that can be used to eavesdrop on you. Same with things that have cameras in them. You've got cameras in your home that you use to, you know, watch your dogs when you go away or that sort of thing. That data can be tapped into. So everything that listens and watches in your house can be used to collect data there without you knowing about it if somebody is nefarious enough to do it and doesn't mind spending the considerable money it would take to get the you know electronics and the knowledge together to do that. Well, my point is lead a transparent life where you never say anything or do anything that you would would be chagrined to find out in the public and there's not really a problem. But when you start plotting against your government and start, you know, making bombs in your basement and uh, you start doing things that you want to make, you know, keep secret, then be advised that anything with a camera and anything with a microphone, you know, could be used to collect information on what you do. That's, that's true. So no, we've never been this, we've never had our privacy <coughs> so threatened as before, but that threat is relative to how much we need the privacy, you see? So yes, I know that uh, that a um, an Alexa device sitting on my counter at home uh, could be used to collect my every word. 
I really don't care a whole lot because my every word is, you know, not interesting to anybody. You can collect it. It just wastes space in some intelligence, you know, uh, operation. I don't think they waste space either. Now, if you are in a very, if you're in a position where somebody would try to get you, you know, somebody would try to, to, uh, cause trouble for you. Well, they can do it more easily than, you know, wiretapping you or listening to your conversations. It would be easier just to set you up, you know, to where you look guilty, even if you aren't. That's not so hard to do. And, and, uh, uh, you know, what do we call it? An image in our culture is worth a whole lot more than reality. So it's just not that, you know, if somebody's trying to get you, they're probably not going to get you by listening to what you say at home, unless again, you're doing nefarious deeds at home. So that's, that's my take on it. I'm, I'm with you. I just don't take it all that seriously. I know it's there. And anytime I, you know, I plan to join the underground and do, uh, you know, dangerous, illegal things, then I'll worry about it. But until that point, it just isn't an issue. Okay. Well, man, that's great. So live the revolution. And uh, I appreciate your time today, Tom. <laughs> Have a great day. Thank you, Will. You're welcome. We'll, we'll go on next to Mario. Welcome, Mario. And please go ahead with your, your two short questions. Hi, everyone. Hi, Tom. I was so Hi, Mario. Uh, I will read, so it's better, so I don't confuse with the English. Okay. When one hit uh, this reality for experiencing one package usually doesn't recall a thing of previous one, doesn't know what he is, where he is, or what he's doing here. Usually, one must learn how the game is played uh, uh, the hard way, keeping his own head around. Most people never, uh, never even seem to realize it's a game or what kind of game, much less uh, it's a self knowing and, and learning growing game. Okay, so here's the question. Given that we, we have free will, it seems to me that even not remembering ever having decided to participate in this experience package, that I somehow must have had, must, must have made the decision. Is that so? Could you elaborate a bit on it? Okay. I was having a hard time hearing that over some squirrely sounds and a few other things. Could you just repeat that question again, or was there anybody else that had good audio that would? That, uh... I'm gonna read it for you, if ah, okay. you'd like. Thank you. Please. Okay. okay. Yeah. Just what was well, the question? I, yeah. Yes. Uh, given that we have free will, it seems to me not even remembering ever having decided to participate on this experience package that I somehow must have made the decision. Is that so? And could you elaborate a bit on it? Yes, we uh, we all have have um, you know we all have free will and we're never made to do anything that we don't want to. And typically, when we come into a new experience packet, if we've been around a few times before, in other words, if we're not newbies in this game of growing up, then there is some planning involved in it because you're you you want to work on those things that you need the most work on those things that are your, you know, your problem areas. That's what you want to work on, not just uh, relish the areas that, that are not your problem areas. So you, you do a little planning and as you do it, you plan with the system. Say, yeah, okay, here are the things I'd like to learn. This is what I'd like to, you know, work on this next time. Or even in your own mind, if you just say, well, I'd really like to excel in a contribution. I really want to do something that makes a difference. Um, if you have any sort of plan like that, the system tries to cooperate you with you the best it can. So it will try to put you in a position where you can do what you're planning to do, what you want to do. But just because it puts you in a position where that's possible, or even that where that's likely that you can do that, once you get there and start making free will choices, all bets are off as far as whether or not you really are put in that position. 
because there is free will, you don't always have to do the things that are expected of you. So even though it was a good plan, it just may not work out. Something else may happen. Uh, the randomness in biology just might have you being born with, you know, one arm and one leg. And that changes everything because you were going to learn a whole lot about uh, yoga. And uh, it's a little difficult doing those postures with one arm and one leg. So you end up doing something else. You say, so plans, yes. Yes, the system cooperates with you. And yes, they sometimes work, but they don't always work because of free will. So there are plans and you do cooperate with them. But you have to deal with whatever happens. Donna, could you read the second one, please? Yes, of course, Mario. Thank you. Mario's second question is, Buddha supposedly said to his followers that life is suffering and proposed to everyone that was interested in getting rid of such suffering to learn a way out of it, <laughs> meditating and experimenting to live in such a way that you would grow and get rid of this cycle of rebirth completely somehow going back to the source, the void, or the like. Uh, from your descriptions on how process actually works, it seems there might be a significant possibility to keep growing, even when this virtual learning lab has exhausted its possibilities for a specific mm -hmm. being. Is that so? Is the learning utility for one person, um, w would it end at this lab? Would we go ahead to other opportunities in MPMR or another PMR. Could you elaborate on that? Sure. It could be all of the above, but you will keep learning. You will keep growing. You will stay in one game or another, whether it's this game or another game. And that is because the nature of entropy is that when you stop putting energy into it to grow, to keep it low, it starts, the, the entropy starts to grow. It gets bigger. So that's just the nature of entropy. It constantly needs your input, your energy to keep it low. So if you do nothing, if you just decide you're done and you don't want to participate anymore, so you're going to sit on a nice fluffy cloud in a comfy, comfy seat and play your harp and, uh, you know, just not participate in this, uh, uh, in, in any kind of growth opportunities, you will start to de-evolve. So, you do need to continually work on it. So there's never a point when you just are done. You're always working. Most of the time, you will come back here because one, you have you have connections here, but two, you have history here, which means you understand how this rule works. You get into a different rule set. It'll take a while just to learn the rules, to learn how to interact there, to learn the culture. So people tend to come back here because they already know all of that background information, which makes it easier for them to get by. They don't have to spend most of their time just trying to figure out how to, you know, how to, how to work within the system. So you will always be able to find something to do. Something to do means you will always be able to find somebody to help, something to give, some way to help others grow up and lower their entropy. You can just be a good example, or you can be somebody who has a light that shines brightly and, uh, you know, it wakes other people up. Doesn't have to make a big splash. Doesn't have to, uh, you know, end up, uh, you know, writing books or having a movie made about you or anything like that. You just come here and be a good, high quality, low entropy person, and that will help everybody who interacts with you to grow up. So because there's so much need here on in this reality frame, there's no reason why you couldn't keep coming back here, back here, and back here after you have a very low entropy because there are people here who need help. This system needs a lot of help. So it, uh, it needs as many low entropy beings in the mix as possible. So there's always something to do, always something to give and the more you're grown up the more you have to give you know when you're a very self-centered person not very grown up you don't have a whole lot to give because you're just so self-centered as you lower your entropy and become love the 
the ability to give back, the ability to, to help starts growing and getting bigger and bigger. That's not the time to quit. That's the time where you really can make the bigger difference. So, yes, you get to come back and you get to come back at a place of your choice. If you don't want to be in this particular virtual reality game, you can request to go to some other game. Maybe you're just curious and want to see how things are in other in other uh, reality frames. That would work. The system will try to accommodate whatever it is you want. Thanks a lot, Tom. You're welcome. Yep. The next question, we will go to Mao. Mao, welcome back. And uh, go ahead, please go ahead with your question. <clears throat> Hi, Tom. So nice to be with you again. Uh, Hi, Mao. Uh, Tom, uh, Tom uh, th this is my, my question here. Uh, in my big toe, is consciousness actually information or data? Does, does it emerge as a result of extremely complex data structures and loop, loops and processes? And is this a conjecture or is this something that, that can be uh, proved? Uh, even subjectively. Okay. Um, you're really asking about the source of, of consciousness. The larger consciousness system is information system, yes. And it has um, lots of information structures and so on. But we can't say that those structures created the consciousness. That may be true, but we can't really say that. It's not a thing that is that can be shown as a fact yet. Probably never, but not yet anyway. I start my, my book, uh, and whenever we talk about origins, by saying that, that consciousness exists is an assumption. Okay, I just bring that in in the beginning as an assumption. So we have to start there. Now, it's not a very wild assumption since we all feel like we're conscious. So just saying that consciousness exists is a pretty mild assumption. So we start with a thing that is conscious. And remember, in the beginning, I had this thing that later evolves into the larger conscious system as just being something that can differentiate between itself in two states. This way, that way. That's all just going to... And after that, it can evolve into what it is today, just from that. Because if it can be aware of two states, it can be aware of three states. It has awareness. It is conscious. So I start with the assumption of consciousness. And then I show how this consciousness system could evolve its ability to interact, to communicate, uh, lower its entropy. And that takes us from the very initial thing, which just was aware of this way, that way, into a system like the larger consciousness system that has created this virtual reality for us as a, as an entropy reduction trainer and this highly complex system has evolved. So that's how the book, you know, that's kind of how this theory works. Now, exactly where did that consciousness come from? Because the, that first, that first primordial, um, consciousness that just knew the difference between this way and that way wasn't brilliant didn't have much experience was just potentiality for the most part and it evolved to be what it is but i start with consciousness and the reason <clears throat> that i felt like i needed to start with a an assumption that consciousness exists is because we are consciousness I'm a consciousness, you're a consciousness, the system is conscious. So if you're consciousness, you're a piece of the system. If you're a piece of the system, it's impossible for you to get outside of the system to have direct knowledge of, of its origin. Where does the consciousness come from? How did that, that, that primordial consciousness end up with the awareness to think that it could be in one state or another? You can't do that because we are consciousness. We're a thing of that consciousness system. So it's just impossible for us to get out of the consciousness system to see it directly, objectively. Now we can make conjecture, but then conjecture is just conjecture. It's not a fact. Facts have to be 
measured directly. And, and, uh, there, there is no way to do that with consciousness. Indirectly, we can say, well, we're conscious. Therefore, wherever we started had to also be conscious. The system is conscious. We're a piece of the system. So we can say that. And that's all true. Those are facts. But exactly the consciousness that came from that first thing, we don't know. Now, I have a little hand waving conjecture that I often use. And that is it's a combination of things. You have to start with a potential, a potential for consciousness. And out of that potential, you have to have um what's it called? Uh, emergent complexity. That is, if you have potential, then things can just emerge out of, you know, things can, can build complexity. You start with all the bits random, no information. Some bits just by chance can go together, connect, make a pattern. Okay, now you have some information. So those things can just happen randomly. And if it happens to make a pattern that is uh, stable, then it may make a thing that we call cellular automata, which is just a very simple little pattern, a very simple little rule. And if it does that, it can create something that can grow and evolve uh, without end. Okay? It's an open-ended process. It's a, it's a process fractal, actually. And you look up cellular automata, you can see that there are cellular automata that that you can make that have all the attributes of a general purpose computer. So that could be the origins of our consciousness and our consciousness system. It may have come out of, out of this uh, idea of spontaneously something coming together just randomly. And that something coming together just happening to be something that was stable that could build on itself. And that's the hand waving conjecture that says how consciousness may come about. But that's different than saying that's a fact. That is how consciousness came about because I don't know of any conjecture that is any more rational than that. That seems to be the one that most people end up with because they can't come up with anything any better, but it's still just conjecture. So I start with it as an assumption because I don't like to start a book based on conjecture. That's not yeah. a good place to start. So I start yeah. on, on the fact that there has to be a couple of assumptions. And that's, that's one of them. Okay. Well, would it be more adequate to look at this as uh, in saying that, okay, consciousness is fundamental and, <clears throat> and it, it behaves or its inner works are similar to a discrete information system. Um, yes, you can you can say that consciousness is an information system because consciousness by definition is about information. That's what consciousness does. It it takes it, you know, that's what when we say we're conscious and somebody says, "Well, what are you conscious of?" what you would respond is information, your five senses. That's yeah. what you're conscious of. See, consciousness is is information so if you say that it's an information system and it can it can evolve then it can evolve into all sorts of things it can evolve into an iuoc an individuated unit of consciousness or it can evolve into a computer that's computing a virtual reality so pieces of it can configure itself to be a general purpose computer other pieces of it can configure itself to be an individual conscious entity so that's the thing. And once you have consciousness, a digital system, it can configure itself to be almost anything that is information based and general purpose computers are information based. So it okay. can do both of those things. Okay, Tom. And uh, lastly, Tom, when, when you refer, for example, in uh, Will's uh, question uh, earlier today, when, when you refer to the, um, that the system can uh, help you or can uh, do something so that you can realize that uh, reality is a lot more than this physical reality. Um, mm -hmm. It seems to me that, uh, okay, we are individuated 
units of consciousness, each one of us, but that there is a super individuated unit or, or of consciousness or something like that that, uh, that can that can do things uh, above what we can do. Or, or mm -hmm. in other words, it seemed to me that that the larger consciousness system is not only composed of of us individuated units of consciousness, but that there is like a base base super conscious or or something yes. like that. Uh, I'm confused here. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's that's true. There is. Uh, <clears throat> whenever you have a a um, information system, you need rules. You need something that plays the executor, you know, the executive part that makes the rules and see how the pieces can talk and interact and so on. In, a, in you know, in, in computer terminology, we call that the operating system. It's the operating system that that configures the information, the things that can talk to what things and what are the formats for those things to talk. And, you know, it's the operating system that does all that. And you might also call that like an executive system. It makes the rules and enforces the rules. And yes, the larger consciousness system is a thing different than just us. It's not just the IUOCs. When it broke pieces of itself off to become IUOCs, it didn't divide itself up into N equal pieces. And those are the IUOCs. So it's nothing other than IUOCs. It didn't do that. It just took pieces of itself with the attributes of consciousness then. So they were conscious. They had free will. And made those pieces such that they were capable of interacting in meaningful ways. That's all. And it can make as many of those as it likes, as it has the bits to, to support. But still, the the LCS is more than just, the, you know, the parts of all its IUOCs. It's the executive function. It's the thing that makes the rules. It runs the program. It's the thing that develops the virtual reality for the IOCs to go learn in. So, yes, there is this uh, this part of the LCS that is much more than just the IUOCs. There's a oh, part of the LCS that is the executive director, if you will, the operating system, the thing that makes everything else work together. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Tom. Thank you. And, and uh, Maui, that's the part that many people then make the analog to, and they say, that's God. Okay, that's, oh. the, that's, the, uh, you know, that's the fundamental thing that, of which everything else has come out of. That's the source. And true enough, that is the source. But it is finite. It is not perfect. Okay, and it and it's it's evolving too. It's evolving. It's not done. Yeah, it's constantly evolving. So mm -hmm. it's it's not a supernatural thing. It's a natural thing. <laughs>